Good morning. Welcome to Monta Vista Chapel. We are so glad that you're here. Whether you're watching from afar or right here in person, I just want to say it is so good to be together. My name is Christina Bilesma, and I'm here to welcome you in and then up, which means I want you guys to look around at who's sitting by you. And if there's a face that you don't quite know, think about after church, maybe going to find them and saying, I want to hear more about your story, or um, I, how can I pray for you this week? Let's get to know each other. And um, the other thing that I'm here to do is welcome you up. That means we want to get our hearts ready to worship the Lord. So this week, um, oh, and I'm holding this right here because you have these little um, note card things that you can take notes on. And there's a little QR code. So if you're brand new, this is one way that you can give by scanning the QR code. But it's also a way that you can find out what classes we offer and what's going on in the church. Um, OK, now that part's done. Um, so this week, I have been having some great conversations with God and with my oldest son and with a really good friend. Um, and I've been asking myself and God, what's my purpose here? And I don't know when the last time that you guys asked yourself, um, what's our purpose here on earth? But God really simplified it. I was making it really complicated. And he shared with me, it's something that Ken actually shared a couple weeks ago in his sermon, but what's the greatest commandment? What's our purpose here on earth? And kids out there, do you guys remember what Ken said? To love the Lord our God with all of our heart and mind and soul and strength. That's the first part. And that means in everything that we do and say, everything in us, we want to love the Lord. And the second one is like that. Do you remember that part? It's to love others as yourself. But it's really hard to do that on our own, in our own strength, with our own just, I want to do it. It doesn't always work out so well. So my encouragement and my invitation to you is... Before I share with you, would you stand up with me? Put your hands out like this. And say, Jesus, I need you. Let's do that one more time. Jesus, I need you. Because unless... Good job, guys. Because unless our hearts are softened and our eyes are open to what God is sharing with us, we don't love that well. So right now, we're going to worship the Lord. We are going to come to him with whatever is going on in your life. Bring it to Jesus right now and worship the one who wants to show you how to do this life. And he is right here in our midst right now, and we are ready to worship. Let's do it. Suffer. 
Father, we come this morning proclaiming how great of a God you are and the great things that you have done. Take a moment this morning from the distractions of our lives and we look around and we see you. We see the great God you are, the great things that you are doing, the great things you have done, and we come believing in the great things that you will do. In your word, Psalm 28 says, Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the voice of my pleas. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts, and I am helped. My heart rejoices, and with my song I give thanks to him. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is our saving refuge. God, you are the source of all the strength we need to live out our days. Let us dig into unearthing these truths, your words, your promises, knowing your joy and your peace. Let your words settle.
Oh God, it is so good to come together and to be reminded of what is most true. We, during our weeks, are surrounded by so many things that distract us, that bring us to a place where we lose hope, where we lose focus, where we lose a sense of our purpose and what you've called us to. And here we come back together and we're reminded that God, you are good, that you love us deeply that you have purposes and plans for us, even in the midst of difficult times um, that will yield fruit we can't even imagine. So as we come together, we surrender afresh again. Another time, we say, God, your way, not ours. May each of us walk away encountering you through scripture, through the word, through worship and music, through one another, through your Holy Spirit. God, will we leave here unchanged? Would we leave here, excuse me, changed, not unchanged? God, we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Well, that didn't come out right, did it? (laughs) Fortunately, God knows what I'm praying way more than I do. Oh, it is good to be here today. Um, Whiteboard day today, but before we get there, Um, we are going to release our children and students all the way through high school today. Um, If you don't know, our high school has a Sunday school gathering once um, a month and then junior high every week along with our children. And so they are released. We're going to say this blessing over them. So if they could stand up and if you would reach out a hand, uh, let's say this blessing over them. So may you know that your heavenly father loves you. May you know that in Jesus, you have been accepted into God's family. May you set your hearts on things from above, the things that matter most to God. Love, forgiveness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and kindness. God has chosen you and calls you his child. As you go, may you be rooted in his redeeming love. So children, go in God's grace. It's so good to have you here with us. As they are leaving, um, I'm uh, just reminded of the fact that Wednesday night activities have started for our youth and our children. And so if you know of somebody who'd like to plug in there, junior high, high school, children's ministry, there's something for everybody on Wednesday night. Also, some of our adult opportunities are starting. There are ongoing ones all year. But one that I want to highlight is kind of Uh, part of one of our three major discipleship paths, and that is about knowing God's story. And it's called Rooted. I think there's a group here who were in Rooted, weren't you? Yay, woohoo! Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a great way for you to come to meet a few other people and to be reminded of what it is God is inviting us and called us to do as followers of Christ. So whether you have been in the church for 20 years or you've just come, Rooted is a great place to get uh, connected. You can find that in the weekly, and we invite you uh, to go ahead and get involved in that. Also, if you've come prepared to give, uh, you can do that through the QR code on the listening guide, or um, if you brought uh, that in a check or something, you can drop that off uh, at the boxes as you exit. So thank you so much for supporting Monta Vista Chapel, both with your time and your treasures. We are grateful. Uh, we see God doing some great things in and through this place. So We are moving into the book of James for a little while. That's where our lectionary has turned us. And um, James is a very practical book. And so I'm going to try to make this morning as practical as possible. I just noticed that my papers here, I hope I have enough papers. Yes, there we go. I didn't check this beforehand. Bad, bad, bad. There we go. Um, But I'm going to try to make this as practical as possible. I'm going to start with a phrase that I think many of us have heard here or there, right? It's the phrase, sticks and stones will break my bones, but, okay, I imagine almost all of you have been given that phrase or taught that phrase as the ultimate comeback from any playground insult, right? Like, it's the thing that will silence everybody, except for one thing. Uh, Those 13 words are amongst the most untrue words ever, ever spoken. Let me illustrate here. For a moment before we get going. Um, what I'd like to do is, man, 
we're having problems this morning, aren't we? Um, what I'd like to do is I want you to think about some words that have shaped you. Now, the way I want to do this is specifically, at least for right now, we're going to look at negative words that have shaped you. So I want you to think whether it's you or whether it's somebody else or a hypothetical person, I want you to think of some words that an authority figure has spoken, maybe that a parent, um, a peer has spoken that form you in maybe, yeah, that have been spoken to you and haven't been really helpful. Uh, it's PG-13, so adjust those words as you speak them, okay? So yeah, what, what things or phrases, ideas may have been spoken to you? Shame on you. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Shame on you. What else? Ah, uh, you're just a follower. So you're not enough. Oh, you'll never amount to anything. What else? Pardon? Yeah, loser. Useless. Other words. Oh, disappointment. There you go. You are so disappointing. Ah, there you go. Ugly. Fat. Fat. Ungrateful. We're going to have to have a group therapy session after this, aren't we? <laughs> we're all remembering the words when they were spoken. Oh. Ah, pathetic. Okay, we'll end with that one because <laughs> that's kind of how we're all feeling now. All right, now my point in doing this is I want you to think, what kind of person do these words create? What kind of person? What are the attributes? Okay, defeated. Bitter. Insecure. Fearful. Angry. Shut down, reluctant, depressed, yeah, loser. <laughs> well, that's just, we're, we're going to say that that's just what they feel like. It's probably not who they really are, right? Okay, yeah, anxious, yeah, anxious. And we could, we could go on here, couldn't we? There's a lot of things that we could, we could say. And the reason I want to start with this is because I want to remind us that words are powerful. Words are powerful, aren't they? Like, they are powerful because we're relational beings, and words express the power of a person's character and nature and essence. It's what puts voice to somebody's character and nature and essence. Words shape us. In fact, I think it's actually safe to say that we are not born into a world in which we create relationships. We could also say we are born into relationships that create us. We're not just born into a world in which we create relationships. We are born into relationships that create us. And that's what leads us to our passage today, which is found in the book of James, chapter 1. And I'd like to begin by reading verses 17 and 18. James chapter 1, beginning in verse 17 and 18. Here James begins by saying, Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Now, I'm going to pause there for just a moment because I want you to notice that James begins with the character and nature of God. And what is the character and nature of God? He is good. He is so good that everything um, that is good, all good and perfect gifts, come from this good God. He gives us all things. And then we go on. And we read, he, that is God, chose to give us birth 
through the word of truth. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. I want you to notice that phrase in verse 18, that God chose to give us birth through his word of truth. Say that again. God has chosen to give us birth through his word of truth. That's a pretty interesting statement, isn't it? That we are given birth by God's word. So what is James talking about here? Because I think it's very easy for us to not do the hard thinking here and just kind of simplify it. And in oversimplifying it, we rob it of its power. Because too often, especially those of us who have grown up in the church, we equate entirely the word of truth with the Bible. So it's often thought, just read the Bible and do what it says and you're good. Now, I don't want to minimize the authority and strength of Scripture. It is God's written word. But God's word of truth is more than something printed on paper. Remember, there was actually no Bible as we understand it when James wrote this text. So what is God's word of truth? Well, again, God's word of truth is God's expression of God's nature and character and essence. It is how God reveals God's self to us. It's kind of like when I say, hey, I'm going to give you, Ray, I give you my word on something. Now, what am I giving you? Nothing, really, but I'm giving you everything because I'm giving you my nature and character, and the only thing my word is worth is what? My nature and character. If I have no character, my word means nothing. It's only as good as my character. And God has revealed his nature and his character, his word of truth, in many ways. We see it, first of all, if I look in order of what scripture tells us, we see it in creation. Paul tells us that in Romans chapter 1, doesn't he? That we can see God's attributes and character by what is made so that everyone is without excuse. We know that there's a God. It's revealed through God's spirit, the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Jesus tells us in John 6 and John 14 through 16 that the Holy Spirit speaks the word of truth to us. God's character and nature, his word is perfectly revealed in and through the person of Jesus, right? That's what Hebrews and Colossians says. In fact, the gospel writer John, he says that in the beginning was the word. And what happened to the word? It became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So the very nature and character and essence of God is made real in the person of Jesus. Therefore, it's also known through the body of Christ in whom God's spirit dwells. So as you speak words that are in line with God's nature and character, it has the ability to be like God's word of truth as he speaks it through us. And then finally, yes, God's word and nature is revealed in scripture. And if these expressions of God's self are really true, then they will always line up with one another, with Scripture being the anchor. So in order to understand what God means when he tells us that we are given birth by God's word of truth, we want to go back to the easel here where we saw where these words, what do they do? They give birth to something, don't they? They give birth to something that is not very beautiful. So rather than our broken words that give birth, birth, we are going to take a look at the words of truth. So words of, actually I'm going to say word of truth because that's what scripture tells us. So here's the word of truth and specifically God's word of truth to us, to you. So if we're it, through scripture, through Christ's life and model and teachings, through the spirit's work, through the body, what are the things that God has said of you and I? Ah, so you go, loved. So I love you. What else? Chosen. 
masterpiece. What else? You are adopted. A treasure. What else? You are redeemed. Yes. What else? You are forgiven. Oh. What else? Set apart. Beloved. Fully known or wholly known. A couple more. Blessed. Valued. Image bearer. Yes. A new creation. Amen. Children of God. And called. Okay, we're going to stop there because we could go forever, can't we? Incredible things. Now, these are quite different than the first words we saw, aren't they? Quite different than the first words we just saw. Um, and I want you to, I want to be clear here that these words can only be spoken of us because of the birth, the life, the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. These aren't true necessarily unless, uh, be, they're only true, excuse me, because of the work of Jesus. So now I want to ask you, what does this word give birth to? What kind of person might this create? Pardon? Confident. What else? Secure. Loving. Pardon? Righteous. So I'm going to put right living. What else? Hopeful. Joyous. Happy, as in a virtue of happy, not just circumstantially. Peaceful. Yeah, fulfilled, because we have purpose. Because one of the things he says is, I have a plan for you. So for fulfilled. What else? Pardon? Content. Generous, yes. Relaxed. <laughs> Yeah, we are not uh, hustling for our worth, nor are we anxious and worried. Absolutely relaxed. Humble, I think, is another one. Because we realize that this comes from this, right? We are birthed of something. Pardon? Anchored. Thank you. We are anchored. Okay. I think that's probably enough. Friends, this is what God is creating. This is what God desires to create from the very beginning. That is the goal of people who reflect the nature and character of God. This is what God's word of truth brings into being. Isn't that incredible? So much more beautiful than the thing that we saw. I mean, which one do you want? Like this or this? Right? Huge contrast here. And then James continues in verse 19 to 21. Let me read that. James says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. And it seems like he's changing gears here, but he's not. He says, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become anger, angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. So, if God's word shapes us, the essence and character through the work of Jesus shapes us into this beautiful reality, then James tells us we need to be careful about our words. Because remember, our words create and shape things as well, can't they? Our words can create and shape things as well. So if we are going to give God space uh, to create 
this with his word of truth, James tells us we should be careful with our words. In other words, we need to let God be God and we not try to be the ones who take over for God. And um, the, the, the question then is why? Like, why do we have to be so cautious, like James says, slow to speak and slow to become angry? Because our words to ourselves and to others, they contradict what God says oftentimes, don't they? Not always. When the Spirit is working in us, God's word flows through us. But when they don't, our words can easily deform rather than reform. So we must be slow to speak, and we must be especially slow to anger. Because the truth is, anger doesn't bring about this kind of righteous life, this good and beautiful life that God has that God desires for us. It's interesting how when someone isn't living this way, like this is a good and beautiful life, right? And it's interesting when somebody isn't living this way, um, it's interesting how we believe that we might be able to spur this on with just a touch of our own anger, don't we? Like if I can just like be a little, add a little shame in it, add a little anger, a little guilt, maybe it'll move them <laughs> in the right direction. But think about it, that's crazy. You cannot create something like this when the means are out of line with the ends. It just doesn't work. Now, I said this a few weeks ago, and I need to go back to it. Anger in and of itself is not a sin. Paul affirms that in Ephesians 4. Anger is simply an energy that compels us towards action. The problem comes when we act out of anger in such a way that we tear people down rather than build people up. In my experience both personally and in my life living, living amongst humans, is that rarely does anger lead to righteously building things up. Sometimes it does. But so often it ends up tearing people down. So we must heed James' warnings in verse 19 to be slow to anger, to be slow with our words, because oftentimes our words create this. And we have to trust that God's word will do the work of creating this. Now, sometimes we are the conduits of God's word. In fact, most of the times we are. But they need to be in line with God's character and nature. So then James continues, if indeed God's word is the one that gives birth to us, he says this in verses 22 to 25. Do not merely listen to the word then. And so deceive yourself, do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. And so again, I think where we started was, remember, God gives birth through his word, right? Through his word of truth. And we see what that is. So we have to be cautious about our own words, especially when those words are driven by anger. And then uh, James flips us back and says, now return back to God's word and don't just look at it and walk away, but be, intent be intentional about it. Take God's word of truth seriously. Too many of us, like James writes, simply glance at God's word, both written in scripture and the, the essence of who God is. We just glance at it, and then we forget about it. We don't let it soak in and change us from the inside out. James tells us that's like somebody who just walks into the, the, the dressing room and sees himself in a mirror and then completely forgets what they look like. So then the question is, how do we engage God's word in a way that it changes us. Well, it's inter interesting. Christina opened that door. Steve here kind of opened that door to us a little bit. But Jesus tells us in John 14 that it's the Holy Spirit who takes God's word and applies it to our lives. That's why the author of Hebrews says that God's word is alive. What, what does that mean? This, this book isn't alive. But through the Spirit, God's word is alive. In fact, it's living and active, Hebrew, the author of Hebrews says, sharper than a double-edged sword. So we must open ourselves to the Spirit's work when we engage God's word. 
not look into a mirror and then forget. In fact, we're going to do that right now. We're going to take a minute to allow God's word, his essence, nature, character that he has revealed to us. We're going to allow that to sink into us a little more deeply. So here are the big things that God has spoken to us, right? Now there's thousands more. We could spend days talking about God's word of truth. But these are a good representation of what God has spoken to you, right? And it's easy for us to walk out of here and say, yep, I know it's true, but we don't let it sink into us. We forget its reality by the time we get out into the courtyard. So if you would do me a favor a moment, and I'm going to ask you like Christina did, to close your eyes for a moment and even receive if you'd like. And you only participate in this if you want. You don't have to. Open your hands on your lap as you sit. Give yourself a posture of receiving what God wants to give you through his spirit. And I want you to imagine maybe that you are sitting amidst the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. Or maybe God or Jesus is kind of God the Father or Jesus cupping, excuse me, cupping your face and he's looking directly in your eye. And he's going to say these words to you. I'm just going to read what we said. What we saw as God's word of truth. I love you. Receive this from God. They're not just words on a page. This is God's nature and character and essence towards you. I love you. I have chosen you. You are my child. I have called you by name. You are a masterpiece. I have chosen and adopted you. You are a treasure. You are redeemed. You are forgiven. Before you even did what you did, you are forgiven. You are set apart. You are beloved. You are seen and known. You are valued. You are a new creation. Amen? Mm. Friends, activated by the Holy Spirit, these and so much more are God's words of truth that give birth to a new life. So we must learn how to allow space for God's spirit to bring God's word to life in our lives. It's actually much more practical than we tend to think it is. Because I would dare say that if we just took this list of words and every morning for the next month sat with them and received what God has to say over us, what is most true about us, that it would change us. That the spirit would do work that none of us could do in anybody else's lives, our lives or anybody else's life. It'll do more work than anything will, is to let God's word change you. So don't just glance at it and forget what it says. Look intently and allow the Holy Spirit to change you. Take God's word seriously, because it will give birth to a new creation. And finally, James circles back to be sure that we remember what he said a little bit earlier in verses 26 and 27. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongue deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Ouch. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So James is saying, just in case you don't forget, if it is God's word that is birthing something beautiful in us, don't forget, your words can get in the way. So watch your tongue. Michelle is going to talk about this a bit more, and she's going to talk about the destructive power that the tongue has in a couple of weeks. So I'm not going to say too much, except that your words spoken in anger or spoken in your own strength, your words that don't reflect the nature and character of God are, as James said, worthless. 
damaging. So rather than popping off at the mouth, show others that God's word has impacted and changed you. Changed you. Show others that God's word, his nature and character as revealed in scripture and creation, the body through the spirit and in and through the person of Jesus. Like, show others that God has transformed you and changed you. Be living displays of the power of God's word. And a good indicator that God's word is birthing something in you, according to James, is as you do the things that the word calls you to do. The kind of things that reflect the nature and character of God, like taking care of widows and orphans in this context, those who are disenfranchised, those who aren't cared for, to take care of those who are in distress rather than reflect the self-serving, divisive, revenge-driven world we live in. You see, I think from James' perspective, it's not so much that actions speak louder than words, because as we saw, words speak pretty loudly, don't they? Words speak very loudly. It's just that actions, they are the indication, uh, the outflow of the new birth that has been given to us through God's word of truth. So, Monta Vista Chapel, we can all agree that this is the kind of life we want to live, yeah? This is the community we desire to be a part of creating. We can't create it on our own. We cannot do it. It requires the living God in us and through us. That's why we talk about Christ in us, Christ through us. We cannot, this is not a self-help project. It requires Christ. But this is what we want. So the question is, how are we going to get there? Through our own words, spoken in our own strength, or through God's word of truth, spoken through scripture, through Christ, through the Holy Spirit, and through his body? It's an important question for us to wrestle with. Because only one of them works. Only God's word of truth births life. Amen? Let me pray. God, we're so grateful that you have revealed yourself through history, through creation, through the Holy Spirit, through Jesus, through the body, and ultimately through scripture where we anchor that truth It's the touchstone to be sure that all other things align. But God, may we not turn your word into a self-effort or a list of things to obey in order that, um, yeah, that we kind of don't get in trouble. But God, may we let your word change us and transform us. May we become the kind of people who because we have received your word, your self-revelation, your essence and nature that says we are loved and forgiven and chosen, that we are adopted and treasured, that we are redeemed, that we are known and blessed, that we have a purpose and a plan, that we are to turn back to you. God, may those words, may they shape us. May they form us into the kind of people who then, as James says, we do the things that reflect your character. God, we live in a world that desperately, desperately needs God. They need you. But they don't just need our empty words. They don't need our position papers. God, what they need is transformed lives, people who have been changed by your word of truth. So help us not get in the way. Help us not think we need to be the ones who add a little bit of our own juice to the equation in order to get it done. May we trust that you're at work, and then may we partner with you in it. God, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks so much for being here. We have an opportunity uh, now to commission um, a family, the Woods family, and they're going to come on up, and uh, they are headed out with Jim into, um, I'll just leave it here.
here, they're headed out into um, Europe, uh, Greater European Missions, and so I'm gonna let them come and share. There's a microphone, thank you. Um, I'm gonna come and let them share a little bit about their story. So would you introduce yourselves and your family and would you stand on the carpet so everybody can see you out in uh, the land out there? And then uh, introduce yourself, let us know what you're doing and how we can pray for you. Yeah, thank you so much. Like Ken said, we're the Woods family. Um, David, Maddie, this is Ruthie and Winnie right here. Um, and yeah, we're missionaries with Greater Europe Mission. On Wednesday, we are leaving for the field. Um, we're flying to Birmingham, England so it's central England, and we're joining a cafe ministry that is part of a local church there. Okay. What are your hopes when you get there, and what do you need on yeah. the way? So our hope is, in going there, is to just create really deep and lasting relationships with people that we meet. Um, the way that we're going to be doing that is through this cafe, through people coming in, through the volunteers that are there, and the many ministries that are run out of this church and cafe. And for prayers, oh, lots. Yeah. <laughs> Maddie's going to take I got over it. now. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a lot, but especially for the girls and for ourselves as we, <laughs> as we transition this week, um, just for the flight, for safety, and for health. Um, and for our neighbors there, that as we settle, um, that the Lord would just be stirring in their hearts. And <laughs> Sorry, wind. And um, just planting seeds of conversations um, so that when we get there that people's hearts are just open and ready to um, just have conversation with us and just that we'd have the courage and the faith to step into those, um, follow the open doors that the Lord puts in front of us, um, and just be faithful. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, we would love to pray and commission you as you go. So if you would raise a hand, if there's a couple elders who are right close by, if you want to pop on up here, elders or staff, if you want to, I'll give just a moment for you to step up if you're close by. And um, we would just like to be able to put a hand on them and be able to commission them. So thank you so much. Let's pray. Our gracious Lord, we're grateful for the Woods family. And we pray that as they respond to the invitation that you've given them um, to partner with a church in England, in Birmingham, that will um, extend ministry there. God, I pray that you would use them in profound ways. God, that you would um, allow them to build relationships with the people uh, in their own neighborhood as well as those in the church that they would be able to come alongside and help support in ways that we can't even imagine right now. I pray for the transition, for all of the uh, travel and uh, the, the re-purchasing uh, uh, stuff for the house over there and settling into a home. Uh, God, I pray for the girls that you would uh, keep them healthy, keep the whole family healthy through this, this transition. And then, God, we pray that uh, through them and in them, uh, your kingdom would come. God, I pray that you would not just uh, use them to impact people around them, but, God, you would use that community to impact them, that their hearts would continue to be shaped and molded uh, more and more into your image. So, God, we pray you use this whole uh, mission endeavor for your glory. We pray this all in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So thank you for being here today. I want to invite you to stand up and receive our parting blessing for today. So now, and I want you to think of this thing here that God is building, right? To him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine, because that's what this is going to take, right? Something immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. According to his power that is at work in us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, both now and forevermore. And all God's people said, amen. Go in God's grace and peace. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.